Welcome to our lecture on sellers, the second of the major epistemological attacks on logical empiricism from the 1950s. Sellers, like Klein, sounds like he doesn't like foundationalism very much. In fact, that's one of his central themes in the paper you read, the attack on the myth of the given. The major, you, you can think of the 1950s as the decade in which coherentism was on the rise. All the major epistemologists from the 1950s, save one, were coherentists of one stripe or another. So the major epistemologists of the 1950s are Quine, Sellers, and Nelson Goodman, a colleague of Quine's at Harvard. Goodman was more interested, spent more time talking about metaphysics and defending a kind of relativism than did uh, Quine. Although Quine, too, is uh, a defender of ontological relativity. It's just he's better known for two dogmas and his epistemological outlook than he is for his metaphysical outlook. In any case, let's take a look at the slides and go through this incredibly difficult article. It's quite long. Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind is a very important paper. It is quite long, and if you had the sense that you didn't quite know what was going on, join the club. The overall theme is not that hard to point out. He thinks there is a central Salarzian dilemma for the kind of foundationalism that he wants to attack. And that attack doesn't talk about the myth of the given, but he's also going to attack the myth of the given. So there's a, we need to figure out what the myth of the given is and what is this argument that he has against it. He says a lot of things, but systematizing what he says in the form of an argument turns out to be quite difficult. So the attack on the myth of the given is not crystal clear. Uh, the second part, we'll talk about the Salarzian dilemma for having experience play a role in the story of justification and knowledge. And then in the third part, we'll talk a little bit about the philosophy of mind features in Sellers. So Sellers is perhaps most famous for his view about theoretical terms and his break from logical empiricism on theoretical terms in science. So if you remember when we were talking about, when, when we looked at the first two, the second of the dogmas of empiricism that Klein wanted to attack, the story that he wanted to undermine was the story that tries to reduce everything to sensation statements, statements about how things appear to you, how they seem to you, that sort of thing. When you do that, you end up with strongly anti-realist inclinations in the philosophy of science when it comes to theoretical terms, terms about things that are not directly observable, but instead have to be inferred from things that are directly observable. And if you're a sense data theorist, which early 20th century empiricism was, it turns out the observables, the obser observation statements have to be put in the language of sense data statements. <clears throat> so even such ordinary things as I'm now looking at my computer screen. There's a computer screen in front of me. That's not a suitable statement of experience because it's a material object statement. It's a statement about something outside of my mind, not just something about the way things appear to me. Sellers' project was to, in part, to explain why you didn't need to think that way about science. His idea was perhaps you had to introduce theoretical terms in terms of the language of observation, but you didn't need to stop there. You didn't need to be able to reduce theoretical terms to the observational realm. You just had to ground it in some way or another. Now we'll look at the attempt to do that with respect to uh, the language of mentation, the language of introspection, being aware of your own thoughts, having inner episodes. Because remember, around the 1950s, if you're inclined toward empiricism, you're going to be inclined toward this position called operationalism, which is the view that you have to define all of your theoretical terms in terms of their observational consequences. Now, in the philosophy of mind, the most obvious and attractive way to do that is to embrace behaviorism. So behaviorism is noteworthy for saying we don't need to talk about unobservable inner mental episodes to understand human behavior. 
all we have to do is talk about stimulus response patterns in human animals. And that will give us a good enough theory uh, without reference to mental states of any sort. So that's the picture of the mind that Sellers has in the background when it comes to the last part, the Jones myth and things like that. So that's the third part that we'll talk about. So number one, myth of the given. Number two, the Salarsian dilemma. And number three, the myth of the given. I mean, sorry, not myth of the given, myth of Jones. So we start with the myth of the given. What is it? First, some quotes from Sellers. Here's what he says. It certainly, it certainly begins to look as though the classical concept of a sense datum were a mongrel resulting from a crossbreeding of two ideas. Idea number one, the idea that there are certain episodes, inner episodes, sensations of red or of sea star, which can occur in human beings and brutes without any prior process of learning or concept formation, and without which it would in some sense be impossible to see, for example, that the facing surface of a physical object is red and triangular, or hear that a certain physical sound is C, I guess that's supposed to be C sharp. I think it's musical notation. I thought it was C, C star, like the firing of neurons in the head, C fiber firings, and he just called it C whatever that symbol is. I think it's meant to be C sharp. So let's go with that. I don't, it doesn't really matter. So the first one is that you have certain inner episodes that are basic awarenesses requiring no prior learning or concept formation. That's the first idea. Second idea, the idea that there are certain inner episodes which are non-inferential knowings, that certain items are, for example, red or C-sharp, and that these episodes are the necessary conditions of empirical knowledge as providing the evidence for all other empirical knowledge, empirical propositions, excuse me. Now, notice the second is a distinctively epistemological position. It is a version of classical foundationalism. There's some stuff that you know in a non-inferential way, and it forms the foundation for everything else that you know, which you happen to know inferentially. So it is the final court of appeals, the non-inferential knowings from which you start. Okay, now that, that was, that's an optimistic portrayal of classical foundationalism because you can be a classical foundationalism foundationalist and also a skeptic. So you could say, look, we have non-inferential beliefs and we have inferential beliefs. And the non-inferential beliefs are justified in a way that the inferential beliefs are not. The inferential beliefs depend on the non-inferential beliefs. And so we get the story of rationality or justification or warrant, whatever normative notion you want to use in describing this structure. But then you could go on to add, but none of this rises to the level of knowledge. It's the story of rationality, the story of knowledge. Maybe we never get there. Maybe we say some different things about knowledge than we say about rationality. But in any case, Sellers is after the non-skeptical foundationalist. That's what two is about. One, however, is not a remark about epistemology at all. It's instead a remark within the philosophy of mind that there are certain episodes, perception, there is a certain fundamental level for perception that doesn't engage structures of the mind at all. Call that basic perception. He calls it sensations of red or of a certain note being sounded. Now, um, if that really is meant to be a C sharp, this is a little bit weird because it takes years of training and practice to become the kind of person who hears a particular note as a C sharp. That's very sophisticated hearing. Sensations of red, maybe not so sophisticated, maybe, maybe newborns. I don't know. I don't know what perceptual systems work like in newborns. I don't think any, any of us remember what it was like. So it's a little bit hard to predict. But look, if there is any such thing as basic perceptual re receptivity that doesn't involve any input or structuring by conceptual material in the mind, it looks like color predicates would be the kind of thing, color properties, 
look to be about as basic as anything, maybe color and shape. That, that's the basic stuff, perhaps. I mean, you, you do the science here to figure out what the basic perception is like. So it doesn't matter what they are, but one is about a claim within the philosophy of mind that at the bottom of sensory experience are basic sensations of some sort or another that don't depend on prior learning or concept formation. Okay, so one is about the philosophy of mind, two is about the epistemology, and his use of the language of there being a mongrel shows he's not real happy with this crossbreeding uh, product. He's actually more negative than that. He thinks it generates an impossible object, sort of like a Penrose stairs. If you don't know what a Penrose stairs looks like, it's really fun to look at. You can just Google it and you'll find it. All right, now this is from one of Sellers' students. I don't think Dan Bonavac wrote his dissertation with Sellers, but he was a student at Pitt when Sellers was, was there in the 70s. Sellers died in 1980. Bonavac finished his dissertation at um, Pitt in, I believe, 1982. So they overlapped. And he has a very fine article on Sellers' myth of the given argument. What exactly is going on in it? So the first thing he points out is if you look at this quote, it looks like first, there are four theses that are obvious. The first is the sensation thesis. Now, Dan suggests that we use different terms for the philosophy of mind stuff and for the epistemology stuff. And I think that's a helpful way to structure, structure the claims. So he says, let's call something a sensing when it's an inner episode that presupposes no acquired conceptual capacities. That's the philosophy of mind thesis from one. And clearly, that's part of what went on in the first claim. The second claim, let's call the epistemological stuff graspings. You can call it whatever you want, so this isn't Seller's language, but we have sensings that do the philosophy of mind work, we have graspings that do the epistemological work. These are non-inferential foundational knowings, and they are the sort of thing that everything depends on. Now, there's a connection between the two that Sellers thinks is central to the myth of the given as well, and that's that sensings are necessary conditions of graspings. It would be a little bit weird if the philosophy of mind thesis were completely divorced from the non-inferential knowledge thesis. And Sellers doesn't think anybody thought that, and actually Sellers himself doesn't think that. He's gonna agree that sensings are necessary conditions of graspings. So basic perception is gonna be needed for there to be non-inferential knowings of the sort that could ground all the rest of what you know to be true. Finally, the evidence thesis. Graspings are necessary conditions of all other empirical knowledge. They are the last court of appeal when deciding what else is true. Now, the myth of the given has been described by many different people. Um, and it's probably worth listening to the people that were colleagues of Sellers and at Pitt, because Pittsburgh is the home of studies about Sellers and um, the people there still admire Sellers a great deal and talk a lot about him. So John McDowell talks about Sellers and says that the given, what he calls sensings, stand in a justificatory relation to beliefs or a worldview. <clears throat> now notice this language of a justificatory relation is not in any of the four theses that we've stated to this point. And Brandom says something similar. The, he says that the myth, myth this is Robert Brandom, who's um, probably the most famous philosopher now working at Pitt. <clears throat> Brandom says the myth involves the claim that some kind of non-epistemic fact about knowers could entail epistemic facts about them. Now that sounds a little bit like the evidence thesis because that's an, uh, a claim about epistemic facts, but it's not quite clear that it's the very same claim. Maybe what we need to do is add a fifth claim, something like this, the justification thesis. Sensings play a role in justifying graspings. Uh, that's using Bonavac's um, 
terminology of sensings and graspings. So not only are sensings necessary conditions for graspings, that's a descriptive scientific claim. The normative claim associated with it is that sensings not only are scientifically necessary, but they're normatively necessary. They play a role in justifying the graspings. All right, here's what Bonavac says about Sellers and these claims. <clears throat> he says, clearly Sellers accepts the first two of these theses. He endorses the sensation thesis, which he describes as quite legitimate, as well as the non-inferential knowledge thesis. Arguably, Sellers also accepts the content thesis. He holds that, quote, the direct, the direct perception of physical objects is mediated by the occurrence of sense impressions, which latter are in themselves thoroughly non-cognitive. So it looks like he does think something like the content thesis is true. He also accepts the evidence thesis in a sense. He says there is clearly some point to the picture of human knowledge as resting on a level of propositions, observation reports, which do not rest on other propositions in the same way as other propositions rest on them. Then Dan concludes, this suggests that Seller's primary target is the justification thesis as Brandom and Rorty and McDowell allege. Okay, let's look at this. So here's what Sellers says he's after and what he concludes in place of the myth of the given. One of the forms taken by the myth of the given is the idea that there is mu indeed must be a structure of particular matter of fact such that each fact can not only be non-inferentially known to be the case, but presupposes no other knowledge either of particular matter of fact or of general truths. Okay, stop with just A. Um, that's a rather messy way of formulating this point, but what I want you to hear when you hear it is just think of uh, Bertrand Russell's logical atomism. Um, everything traces to the logical atoms, which are sense data reports. The sense data reports are non-inferentially known. If anything is known, those are the things that are known. And knowledge of them doesn't presuppose or rest on knowledge of anything else. They are statements that are simply given to you by experience itself. So you don't have to know any other particular matters of fact in order to know one particular one of them. That's the atomism part of the view. And you certainly don't need to know general truths in order to know that it appears to you that there's a, uh, a red Corvette in your driveway, or at least a red something or other in your driveway. So that's the first part, the atomism and um, the basicality of the of our knowledge of the atoms, that's A. So there must be basic atoms, that's the first point. And these basic atoms have to be such that non-inferential knowledge of facts belonging to this structure constitutes the ultimate court of appeals for all factual claims, particular and general, about the world. So everything traces to these things, everything depends on them, that's why they constitute the foundation of all of our knowledge. Okay, that's the view he's after. What does he think is wrong with it? Well, here's what he thinks we want to say instead. Quote, empirical knowledge, like its sophisticated extension science, is rational, not because it has a foundation, but because it's a self-correcting enterprise which can put any claim in jeopardy, though not all at once. Now remember, um, when we talked, I think we talked in this class about Otto Neurath, um, one of the early members of the Vienna Circle. He's sort of the godfather of coherentism in the 20th century. And his metaphor for coherentism was the ship at sea metaphor. Um, our cognitive understanding of the world is, is like a ship at sea um, that needs to be repaired as you continue to try to stay afloat. And in the process of trying to repair it, there aren't any privileged parts of the structure that are immune from having to be fixed. You fix what's broken, that's what you do. So there aren't any special parts of the ship that uh, never need to be revised. 
And that's what Sellers is hinting at here. Empirical knowledge is rational, not because it's got a foundation, but because it's a self-correcting enterprise, which can put any claim in jeopardy, though not all at once. All right, now the target here is a particularly strong version of foundationalism, that's clear. The strong version says, the foundation is justified independently of any relation it has to the superstructure. And the superstructure is justified solely on the basis of the kind of support generated for it from the foundation. Now you can imagine um, weakenings of this view that still would appropriately be called foundationalism. You could say, well, there has to be a foundation, but there's no particular reason it has to be justified all on its own independently of any relation to the rest of the structure. It just has to get some part of its justification independent of its relation to the rest of the structure. Call that weak foundationalism. There are people who have defended this view. And uh, if you recall, I said, all the major epistemologists of the 1950s were coherentists, save one, but I didn't say who that one was. That one is Chisholm, and Chisholm defends foundationalism, but he doesn't defend classical foundationalism. He defends a version of weak foundationalism, which we'll talk about when we get to his view. Okay, so the myth of the given, there's a certain kind of logical atomism and strong foundationalism that Sellers is targeting, and in place of that, he wants to emphasize something like the Otto Neurot metaphor about the ship at sea where you're just fixing what's broken and that can happen anywhere. So there aren't any unrevisable claims. There's no such thing as infallible knowledge that never has to be questioned in the future. Any claim can be put in jeopardy, though of course not all at once. Now let's call the immediacy thesis. This again is. Bonavac's language. The immediacy thesis is the conjunction of the five theses above. Um, and notice that what Sellers outlines here, the view that he's after, adds a couple of claims to theses one to five above. One is the atomism thesis, graspings presuppose no other empirical knowledge. And the adjudication thesis, graspings constitute the ultimate court of appeals for all empirical knowledge. That is, the credibility of all empirical knowledge claims trace to the credibility of claims about graspings. Now, as I pointed out, note that the conclusion doesn't reject foundationalism itself, but only a particular form of it, one on which the foundations are immune from revision in a way that the superstructure isn't. All right, so that's the Salarzian position. We're after a certain kind of foundationalism. What we want to understand is what's the argument for this? We know what you want, but what's the argument? Um, now that turns out to be incredibly difficult. That's the million dollar question. But here are some hints. The first hint is that rather surprisingly, you get this extended discussion of the pri about the priority of being X to looking X. And what in the world that has to do with rejecting classical foundationalism is not immediately obvious. So here's a quote from Bonnebach again. Sellers argues for the conclusion that being read is logically prior is a logically simpler notion than looking red. And similarly, that the concept of looking green, the ability to recognize that something looks green, presupposes the concept of being green. So this is, this is kind of a Kantian strain in Sellers' thought. Kant, at certain points, seems to suggest that there's an incoherence in standard versions of empiricism, because you're supposed to be able to be presented with, through sensory organs, the redness of an object, the greenness of an object, something like that. So you have these basic ideas that come in through the senses, but they're characterized in conceptual terms. So Kant thought and insisted that this was an incoherent story. You can't be appeared too greenly unless you've already got the concept of being green, unless you've got the concept of greenness. Otherwise, you're not structuring the experience by anything at all. And that's a little bit what Sellers is sounding like. Now, 
you should have question marks in your mind at this point. Sellers is actually thinking about Chisholm at this point. I, I don't think he mentioned him explicitly, but after this paper came out, Chisholm and Sellers had extended inter interchanges in the literature on comparative and non-comparative uses of color terms. So Chisholm is a foundationalist and thinks that all of our knowledge of the world traces to, in some sense, appearance statements. Now Chisholm introduces a kind of weird way of describing them. He doesn't like to reify sense data, so he doesn't want there to be sense data in his ontology. So what he says is, instead of talking about the data of sense, I'm gonna talk about ways of being appeared to. And he calls that the adverbial theory of sensing. And so instead of saying, I'm acquainted with a red sense datum, Russell would talk like that. Chisholm says, I am appeared to redly. So you turn the color in question into an adverb and you make the adverb characterize the appearance. So that part, that's technical aspects of Chisholm's view. But the point he was trying to hang on to is that there are these non-comparative uses of color terms when I say I'm appeared to redly. I'm not comparing the color of this thing with how red things ordinarily appear. I'm just reporting the immediate content of my appearance state. Sellers didn't like that. Sellers wants even those basic statements to somehow be tied to more general and theoretical structures so that the concept of looking green presupposes having the concept of being green, and that will require some way of thinking about or referring to the way things, the way green things ordinarily appear in general. So Sellers is the defender of the comparative use of color terms, and Chisholm was defending non-comparative use of color terms. There's maybe some way of seeing a connection between that and the kind of foundationalism that Sellers is after. Maybe classical foundationalists have to agree with Chisholm. So maybe by going after Chisholm, you're also going after classical foundationalism. But it's a bit of a mystery at this point. So that's one thing that is involved in this argument, whatever the precise structure of the argument is supposed to be. The second thing involved in it is the holism of the conclusion. The section concludes, this is, I'm quoting Bonavac again. The section concludes with a startling declaration. And this truly is startling. Just that quote, here's, here's a quote from Sellers now. One can have the concept of green only by having a whole battery of concepts of which it is one element. But that's really surprising. And furthermore, that there's an important sense in which one has no concept per pertaining to the observable properties of physical objects in space and time, unless one has them all. And indeed, as we shall see a great deal more besides. Well, let's stop with just the first part of that last one, unless one has them all. Um, when I read that, I think uh, somebody doesn't recognize a reductio when it smacks them in the face. It's clearly false. There is no sense in which you can't have any concept without having them all. That would make us all godlike in an important respect. And it's just bizarre that anybody would think this is a deep insight. This is nothing more than a straightforward reductio. So it is, as Bonavac notes, a startling declaration. Okay, where does that take us? All right. A couple of remarks about these two central features, the, the priority point and the holism point. First, on the priority point, Bonavac says this is about logical priority, but I don't think it in fact is. Um, it's not the logical priority of is over looks. That's, to me, utterly trivial. Um, if you want to tell me what the meaning of looks is, it's going to be a meaning which is a function of the looks relation and the property of being phi. Looks is a relation between a person and something else. And if something looks phi, the relation will be a relation between, say, me and the property of being phi. That's all it takes to establish the logical priority of is over looks. But that's not what uh, Sellers is after. He's after the, pro the epistemic priority of is talk over looks talk. 
So Chisholm and other foundationalists say everything bottoms out in some way or other with how things appear or how things look to you. Sellers' holism wants to turn that around. He wants to say, no, that's not right. You have to have the general concepts first. And so all of your reports about how things look to you depend on background knowledge of what it is to be that way. And those things take epistemic priority over the appearance claims. So things don't bottom out with looks talk. You get to the looks talk and underneath all of that is the is talk. Okay, so that's uh, the first point is it's epistemic priority, not logical priority that's supposed to be at stake here. Now he attempts to establish this epistemic priority requirement through two claims. One is an endorsement claim, and the second is an indistinguishability claim. So look at the endorsement claim. The statement X looks green to Jones differs from Jones sees that X is green in that whereas the latter both ascribes a propositional claim to Jones' experience and endorses it, the former ascribes the claim but doesn't endorse it. So notice this is a third person reporting about Jones. Say, you or me. And if you say X looks green to Jones, you're not endorsing the claim that X is in fact green. If you say Jones sees that X is green, it looks like you are endorsing that X is green. So that's one difference between the two claims, sure enough. All right, then he's going to endorse an indistinguishability claim. Thus, when I say X looks green to me now, notice now we're doing first person reporting. I am reporting the fact that my experience is, so to speak, intrinsically an experience, uh, intrinsically as an experience, indistinguishable from a veridical one of seeing that X is green. Now here, I think we need to be uh, really picky. Need to be really picky about what you said and what you didn't say. Um, indistinguishability, I think, should be resisted. That is not what I communicate or say or mean when I say X looks green to me now. I do not say or mean the fact my experience is intrinsically indistinguishable from a veridical one of seeing that X is green. Now, it may be true that my experience is indistinguishable from a veridical one. I, I'm not questioning whether or not that's in fact the case, but that's not what I said. So if, if you want to embrace some indistinguishability claim, you can't do it in terms of what the person is saying or reporting or meaning by the remark that they just made. That is not what they're saying. It's just something that might be true if the report of the experience is accurate, but it is not itself what the person said. Okay, now um, I think no matter how you try to construct the argument from these claims, endorsement, indistinguishability, the stuff about the priority of look is over looks, um, the holism in the conclusion, it will be messy. And this is one of, uh, uh, let's call it seller's vices. There are people in the 20th century who never went to graduate school and are truly impressive philosophers. Sellers is one of them. In a way, Wittgenstein is one of them, although technically he did end up getting a degree from Cambridge after the fact. Another one is John McDowell, who is currently at Pittsburgh. Kripke also happens to be one. And Kripke is an outlier here because Kripke is not hard to read, not hard to understand, but the other people who did not go to graduate school, tend to be mysterious, murky, and um, inordinately complex. Let's put it that way. Doesn't mean they're not smart, and it doesn't mean they don't have a lot worth studying, but their communication skills in writing needed some work. And Sellers is one of those. So Sellers' father, Roy Wood Sellers, was an epistemologist who taught at Michigan his whole career and, and claimed and complained later in life that his work didn't get the attention it deserved. And the reason was because he wasn't on the 
uh, East Coast in the Northeast part of the country. And there's some truth to that. Things are much more compressed geographically in the Northeast and many of the major philosophy departments of the world are located in the Northeast. And people outside of that sphere have a harder time getting paid attention to than people in that sphere. But Sellers wasn't in that. I mean, does Pittsburgh count as being in the Northeast? Maybe if you live in St. Louis, it counts as Northeast, but it's on the Western side of Pennsylvania and Sellers, not Roy Wood, but Wilfred Sellers was not ignored. He was taken very seriously, but he did not go to grad school. And there's a certain kind of discipline, I think, that you learn in good graduate programs about how to communicate and how to write that Sellers could have benefited from. In any case, we're gonna move on from here because you can get lost. There've been dissertations written about what exactly this attack on the given is supposed to be. And it's a very complicated matter and it's not always clear, but there is an argument here. This is the second part of this lecture. Once we move past the myth of the given, there's a clear Salarzian dilemma for foundationalism that can be gleaned from this paper. The person that made this clearest is Larry Bonger. Bonger was, is still a coherentist. Well, actually he's not a coherentist anymore. He converted to foundationalism in the 90s, but he was one of the few coherentist voices still around after the influence of Chisholm was felt in epistemology. So remember, Chisholm is sort of the lone holdout of foundationalism in the 50s. But by the time you get to the 70s, it turns out there are hardly any coherentists left. The only well-known ones were Keith Lehrer, a student of Chisholm's at Brown, and Larry Bonger, who was a student of Sellers from Pittsburgh. And Bonger has a virtue that's at the other end of the spectrum from Salarzian vices, and that's that Bonger is so crystal clear and easy to understand. So here's what Bonger tells us Sellers is up to. Bonger tells us that there's this Salarzian dilemma that any dependence on the myth is going to have to face. It's the relationship of sensation, or what Bonavac called sensings, to what is known or justified. And Sellers' point of view is that the relationship between those two is causal, not epistemic. So here's the idea. Oh, let me explain quickly what the regress argument for foundationalism is, because you're going to see that that has to be understood in order to understand the argument. So let me talk just a little bit about the regress argument. The regress argument for foundationalism starts like this. Stuff that you know or rationally believe sometimes depends on other stuff that you know or rationally believe. So that's the evidential basis for what you know or believe. But of course, it can't perform this support um, function if it itself is just arbitrary or without any good standing, intellectually speaking, on its own. So it has to be justified or rational in order to impart justification or rationality to what it's supposed to be supporting. You can't transfer something from one thing to another unless the first thing has it. So where did the first thing get it? Well, suppose it got it from some other source. Now, you keep tracing backwards. You do that long enough and you're gonna find out you've only got three choices or maybe four. Maybe the supports relation ends up going in a circle. So you end up back where you started. Uh, that's not a very pleasant option because it looks like you're endorsing circular reasoning. So let's throw out circularity. Second option, the regress just stops at an arbitrary point and that's all that there is to say about it. Call that assumptionalism. The story of knowledge bottoms out with basic assumptions that you make and somehow that's supposed to be okay. Now, the last part, somehow that's supposed to be okay, is astonishing. Why is that okay? Well, there are people who defend such a view. I think pretty clearly this is Wittgenstein's view in uncertainty. Um, it's also been defended by Gil Harmon in the last. Gilbert Harmon is uh, a philosopher who's been at Princeton his whole career, started in the 60s, 
was a student of Klein's. And he's been defending assumptionalism with a grad student of his whose name I can't remember right now. But if you look under Harmon in the last, say, 10 or 15 or 20 years, you'll find assumptionalism in the title of one of his papers, maybe more than one. All right, now if you don't like assumptionalism, to me it sounds like uh, skepticism. It's just on the assumption that you know the starting points, everything would be cool, but you don't know the starting points, they have no standing. And the skeptic says, yep, that's my view, which means you don't really know anything. You just, you would know if you knew the starting points, if you knew where the regress stopped and the status that the stopping points had, that would be cool. Okay, so assumptionalism stops at arbitrary points. Um, the next option is the regress never stops. That's called infinitism. It's been defended by Peter Klein over the last 20 years. Peter Klein was an epistemologist at Rutgers. He has since retired. Um, his most famous book is on the Gettier problem called, the book was called Certainty and was published in 1980. But after writing that book, he turned to a series of articles which started appearing, I guess, in the maybe late 80s, early 90s, defending that it's really okay to have an infinite regress here. It's not a vicious regress. But most people have said, and foundationalists said, you can't be, you can't be embracing infinite regresses. That's just, that's, that's just not going to work. So you have to stop at some point, and you have to stop in a way that's not arbitrary. Okay, so that's the regress argument for foundationalism. So now let's see what Sellers says is wrong with this view. He says this, so you're gonna stop if you're a classical foundationalist at statements that are reporting the content of your present experience. So first claim, either experience has propositional content or it doesn't. Now, um, let's spend a moment talking about that. So experience, remember one thing I said about Hume, when we talked about Hume, I said, uh, Hume is famous for having said that he couldn't, he looked inside himself uh, and he couldn't find himself. All he could do was find ideas. And I said, well, he's not looking in the right place. Because take, suppose you've got a mental state. Let's call it, uh, that's terrible. We're now calling it MS. Let's not do that. Let's call it M. Now, M could be any of a number of mental states. It could be a belief. It could be a degree of belief, a credence. Bayesians like to talk about credences. It could be a hope. It could be a fear but it could also be a sensory experience. Now, for the other ones that I brought up, these are all attitudes in the following sense. They are mental states of a particular person, and they have a content, X. In the usual cases, the content is reported with a that clause. I hope that the coronavirus disappears quickly and we can get back to ordinary life. Now notice I reported something with a that clause. And what follows a that clause is a complete sentence. Complete sentences express propositions. So for many of the mental states that we're talking about, they count as propositional attitudes. Now that's what Sellers is asking us to consider. Is experience itself a propositional attitude or isn't it? Okay, if it is, you should be able to tell me what the proposition is. That would seem to be a minimal requirement. But notice that some people think experience is uh, representational, but not a propositional attitude. This is Tyler Burge's view. Tyler Burge teaches at UCLA and is one of the most important philosophers of mind of the last, say, 25 or 30 years. What's the difference between propositional and representational content? Well, a proposition has truth conditions. So propositions are the sorts of things that are capable of being true or false, but some representations are not like that. 
for example, take a map of the WashU campus. It has um, accuracy conditions. You can uh, point out that some maps are more accurate than other maps, but maps aren't true or false. So representational content has accuracy conditions. Propositional content has truth conditions. Um, so if you think experience only has representational content rather than propositional content, um, you will endorse the second conjunct, the second disjunct here. If you think it has truth conditions rather than mere accuracy conditions, then you will endorse that it has propositional content. Okay, so that's the first premise. Here's, here comes the dilemma. Let's suppose it doesn't have propositional content. If it doesn't have propositional content, it can't render intelligible the link between it and the beliefs we form on its basis. Now this language of render intelligible is Bonjour's language. It can't let us make sense of the beliefs that we form on the basis of it. So the idea is this, um, you want to get to this conclusion. How did you get there? From what did you derive this claim? What is the basis for the claim? Well, you want to cite something up here. That's a question mark in case. Let me see if I can try that again. You want to cite something up here that would lead a person to understand why this makes sense to you from your point of view. Now, if you don't cite something with propositional content, how in the world are you going to do that? Right? We're going to say, why do you think X? And you're going to, what, point to an experience? Why don't you report the content of the experience? Well, the answer to that is I can't because experiences don't have propositional content and so they don't have the kind of content that can be reported. The only thing that you could report would be something in the form of a sentence and sentences express propositions. So I can't do that. So uh, what could I do? I could just, I don't know, point to the experience, except you can't point to an experience. It's an inner mental episode, so you can't do that. So Sellers holds, we're not going to be able to pull this off if we don't attribute propositional content to the experience. It won't be the right kind of thing to make intelligible the link between it and the beliefs that we form on its basis. So think about what Chisholm would say here. Chisholm would say, look, experiences do have content. Um, the content is conveyed by the manner in which you're being appeared to. So you're being appeared to re readily, for example. And as a result, you come to believe that something is read. That's pretty cool because notice there's a relationship of content between the appearance statement and the belief that you form on its basis. Both of them have content characterizable in terms of the property of being read. That's what Sellers is looking for. He says, if you can't give me a relationship of content between what's in the experience and what's in the beliefs that you form on the basis of the experience, you're in trouble because then you can't, you have to be able to render intelligible the link between experience and belief if experience is going to be what justifies or makes rational the belief. Okay, so first, if you don't have propositional content, you're in trouble. Now, what if you do have propositional content? <clears throat> now, Sellers holds that experiences don't have propositional content, but forget that for a moment. What if you do have propositional content? How is that a problem? Sellers thinks if it did, it would be subject to normative assessment and hence couldn't stop the regress. So think here of perceptual awareness and suppose you are appeared to as if electrons were floating in the air. I have no idea how that would happen, but you're just having this experience. Why is that a sane experience, an experience that is a suitable response to your 
external environment. If it isn't a sane or suitable response to your environment, how could it possibly justify your belief that there are electrons floating in the air? Okay, now notice what I did with this example. You have a particular appearance. It's a, a, an incredibly strange one, but people have strange experiences. If you, if you prefer a different, less unusual kind of experience, look behind you and suppose it seems to you that there's an elephant in the room. Well, that's not a sane or suitable response to your environment either. So this is the normative assessment of your experience. The idea is we will assess, and you should assess as well, the standing that your experiences have. They can't be a suitable stopping point all on their own because you can subject them to normative assessment. And if they come up short, then they're not the right kind of experience to justify beliefs about your external environment. That's the heart of the Salarzian problem. If they have propositional content, we can nor normatively assess the experience and it will only be suitable for justifying beliefs that are based on it when it passes normative scrutiny. Okay, so the relation of sensation, Sellers concludes, even though it's obviously a causal relation, can't be epistemic in the way required by foundationalism as a way to stop the regress of epistemic assessment. All right, now that's a straightforward and interesting argument. It says you either have propositional content or you don't. If you don't have propositional content, you can't, the experience can't do any work to justify claims that do have propositional content. And if it does have propositional content, it can't stop the regress. Okay, so that's the second part. Now, in the process of this paper, some other things show up. I'll just mention one in passing. I mention this in passing because in the 50s, we'll see this when we read Donald Davidson as well, there's this astonishing aspect to philosophy in the 50s that's part of the seduction of analytic philosophy. So remember what's central to analytic philosophy. If you think about mind, world, and language, uh, the heart of analytic philosophy says we address the relationships to these by starting with the language circle. That turns out to be what's fundamental to all the analytic philosophies that we've been looking at. And that heritage carried on even when the analytic philosophies were being rejected as they are here by Sellers. Even so, the fundamentality of language didn't get rejected so easily. So you get this weird sort of picture in the 50s and 60s that without a language, thought is impossible. Now, when you think about that, I hope that strikes you as an utterly bizarre idea. What do you mean you have to speak a language in order to have any thoughts? I would have thought the way we learn language is by having pre-linguistic thoughts and being taught the language and connecting it up with our experiences and ideas in our head. And that's the way we do things. After all, I learned what an apple was when my mother picked up an apple, pointed at it, and said the word apple. I was having various experiences and thoughts and uh, happened to get lucky and connected the sounds she was making with the objects she was pointing at. And I then learned what the word apple meant. On that story, thought is clearly prior to language. But in the 1950s and 60s, and even some people today, uh, you find people who insist that language is prior to thought. Um, Sellers is one of those. He's a linguistic nominalist. Here's a quote. All awarenesses, all awareness of sorts, resemblances, facts, etc. in short, all awareness of abstract entities is a linguistic affair. Well, properties are abstract entities. So if I learn that the object my mother was holding up was an apple, I was showing awareness of abstract entities namely the property of being an apple. And according to Sellers, that has to be a linguistic affair. So I would have already had to have learned a language. Sellers thus wishes to identify the possession of a concept with mastery of a term in a language. This doctrine entails that Locke, Barclay, and Hume were wrong in thinking that we are, quote, aware of certain determinate sorts simply by virtue of having sensations and images. Merely having sensory experiences is not sufficient for 
awareness of abstract entities, including entities such as properties. You'd have to have a language for that. Now, this is this fits with a, a self-conception that Sellers has because he often describes his views as moving empiricism out of its Humean stage and into a Kantian one in which for Kant, intuitions are, sensory experiences are intuitions. Intuitions without concepts are blind. Kant said that. I think it's a fair response to say you don't get to defend any view you hold by citing Kant as an authority. Here, Sellers is not defending his view. He's describing it. And this is an astonishing position to, to hold. Now, I'm going to suggest a way in which you might embrace it. But look, the kinds of species that use language, the kinds are very limited. Human beings use language. Some other cognitive beings, beings with mental capacities, appear to be capable of learning a language, at least a limited language. But as you moved down the species list of animals with cognitive capacities, you end up with animals that no longer have cognitive capacities, no longer are capable of thought, but are capable of sensation. So presumably earthworms are capable of sensation, but I expect they're not capable of thought. It doesn't matter where you draw this line, but sensation is a lower capacity than thought. But you don't have to get all the way up to human beings before you find animals with cognitive capacities involving thought. And you don't even have to get up to species with, that are capable of learning rudimentary languages, capable of being taught rudimentary languages, such as baboons or the great apes or things like that. And from a, an ordinary common sense perspective, you just look around the world and you, have, you see various animals and you ask yourself, do these animals think? Are they capable of thought? And it's a bizarre view to think, well, they could if they spoke a language, but they don't speak a language. So I used to train horses. I think horses can think. It's pretty obvious. They anticipate experience. I show up. Princess got excited. She knew it was time to eat or time to get out of the stall. These are about as obvious an attribution of thought to uh, non-linguistic animals as we can get. And I'm inclined to side with G.E. Moore on these things. My horses could think. My dogs can think. I don't have any dogs anymore, but my daughter's dog can think. Cats can think. They're just better at hiding their thoughts from you because they're utterly inscrutable what they're thinking. But animals think, and they don't have to speak a language in order to be able to think. So this linguistic nominalism I view as a holdover from the idea that motivated analytic philosophy. And once you give up analytic philosophy, it's not clear why you hang on to the vestiges of it. When you draw the circles, mind, world, and language, there's really no reason whatsoever to start the story of the interrelationship between these things from the language circle. Okay, enough on linguistic nominalism. Let's turn to the philosophy of mind. That has to do with the myth of Jones. What is Sellers trying to do here? He is trying to show you that you can develop a theory with non-observational elements in it that can't be reduced to observational statements, but are nonetheless perfectly acceptable from a scientific point of view. So the theoretical parts of science don't have to be understood purely in observational terms. And so Sellers is one of the early realists in the philosophy of science. He thinks we should take the theoretical language seriously. Maybe it has to be introduced in terms of observational categories, but it doesn't have to be reduced to it in the way that would lead you to be an instrumentalist or anti-realist about the theoretical parts of science. Now that turns out to be a hugely important advance over early empiricism in the 20th century of the sort that Russell and maybe Wittgenstein, but lots of the early versions of logical atomism and classical foundationalism affirmed. So how is that supposed to go? The idea is he wants to tell this myth and then he wants you to recognize yourself in the story. Does the reader not recognize Jones as 
man himself in the middle of his journey from the grunts and groans of the cave to the subtle and polydimensional discourse of the drawing room, the laboratory, and the study. So it is a myth, but it's the kind of myth that you find in just so stories, right? This is supposed to be something I sort of made up, but Really, that's the way it happened. That's the way we got ourselves into this position. Well, what is the position we're in? Well, we're in a position where we started from a purely observational level and we ended up ascribing thoughts and sensations, unobservable states to ourselves and other human beings. Now, how did that happen? Well, you would have thought that the story would go like this. Here's what we did. We were born, we started having experiences, and we had the capacity for sensory experience, and we also had the capacity for introspection. And so we would often look inside and end up noticing that we had sensory impressions from yesterday that could still be accessed in some way or another. That's called memory. So we have internal mental states that can be introspective. They can't be experienced with the five senses, but they count as the same kind of thing, epistemically speaking, as whatever we get from experience. That's not what Sellers wants you to think. So here's what he wants you to think. Behaviorism was a great story. It reduced all of mentation to stimulus response patterns in human beings. But it turns out that's not a very good view because it's an anti-realist view about theoretical entities. We do want to be able to talk about thoughts and sensations, and we really do use the language of mentation when we're trying to understand human behavior. So what we have to have is a way of introducing the theoretical aspects of our ordinary view of things in a way that traces them to stimulus response patterns of the sort that behaviorists wanted to limit our discussion to. So here's what Sellers says. We're going to endorse methodological behaviorism to replace reductionism. Behaviorism of the sort defended by Watson and Skinner tried to reduce the mind, eliminate the mind in favor of just the language of stimulus response patterns. Sellers says we're not going to do that, but we are going to be methodological behaviorists. So theories don't have to reduce to the observable but they have to be introduced in terms of basic observational vocabulary. Here's a quote from Sellers. The behavioristic requirement that all concepts should be introduced in terms of a basic vocabulary pertaining to overt behavior is compatible with the idea that some behaviorist, behavioristic concepts are to be introduced as theoretical concepts. So we're going to be able to start from a basic observational vocabulary introduce some terms in that way, and yet have those new terms somehow be not observable, not parts of the observable vocabulary. How do we do that? Well, we do it in terms of models. Sellers is one of the first people who used the language of models for talking about how science develops. So here's Jones' theory. You imagine Jones initially as having access to only overt utterances. Jones's theory is that according to it, the theory, overt utterances are but the culmination of a process which begins with certain inner episodes. So he first has access to noises coming out of mouths and he generates a model. Jones' model says, oh, this is the product of something that starts on the inside of the organism in question, and results in noises coming out of their mouth. That's a fair enough thing to do. I mean, we do this in medicine, for example, right? You break out in a rash, and you might say, okay, the rash is the observable stuff. How did we get here? Oh, I bet there's something inside the body that we can't see, and there's a process leading from it to the rash developing. That's the idea here. You're just positing certain inner episodes. So don't think of the certain inner episodes as distinctively mental at this point. Just think of them as stuff underneath the skin that you can't see. Okay. And let us suppose that his model for these episodes, which initiate the events, which culminate in 
the overt utterances is that of overt behavior, verbal behavior itself. That's a bit mysterious. Okay, so your model of the episodes, namely the process that leads from the inner episodes to the overt behavior, the model is that of overt verbal behavior itself. Right now, that leaves me with a question mark. I don't know what that means. Good, he says. I will put it in other words. Using the language of the model, the theory is to the effect that overt ver verbal behavior is the culmination of a process which begins with, and we're going to call it inner speech. All right, so what are these inner episodes <clears throat> that begin this process? Well, they're inner. And then what kind of inner? Well, our model is that of overt verbal behavior itself. So we say they're inner speech episodes. Okay, that's where we start. Second, the idea then is that psychological, I guess this is third, <laughs> I can't count. All psychological theorizing begins from observational starting points, that's noticing overt utterances. And then the inner is introduced here by a model that it appeals explicitly to features of overt behavior, namely speech. That sounds fairly straightforward, a fairly straightforward case of modeling one thing by another thing, which we find in science all over the place. So what could be wrong with this? Here's what I want you to notice. You have to be able to understand the behavior in question without appeal to mentation at all from the beginning. And you have to be able to characterize the difference between linguistic behavior and mere noises when it comes to speech or linguistic behavior and say marks on a paper or in the sand without appeal to mentation. All right, so when I lecture to you, when I do lectures, I try not to make random noises apart from using words. Most people who talk in public make an effort to minimize noise that has no meaning, no semantic content. But nobody's good at doing that. Uh, well, there are people who I, I suppose never make noises that don't have semantic content, but just the word um. You wait long enough, make no noise between the semantic items that come out of your mouth and all of a sudden you feel like you have to make some noise to fill in the void. And so um, you start saying um, <clears throat> or you say various other things. You make other noises. Sometimes you clear your throat. <clears throat> when I do that, that's not a piece of linguistic behavior. You don't ask yourself, damn, I wish I knew what that meant. You don't. All right, so what's the difference between linguistic behavior and mere noises? Unless you can draw a distinction between those two things, you can't get the Jones myth off the ground in the first place. Because notice, it starts with overt verbal behavior. Well, what is that? What is verbal behavior? Well, it's a certain kind of linguistic behavior. And I say, well, maybe overt verbal linguistic behavior is recognizable, but it's a kind of noise making that certain organisms may have. Well, horses neigh, cows moo, dogs bark, lions roar. There's all sorts of noises in nature. Tell me how you went about distinguishing linguistic behavior from mere noises without appealing to mentation to start with. Now, this turns out to present a very serious challenge to the Jones myth because Think of the plausibility of this is basically a Gricean story about meaning. Linguistic behavior is distinguished because it has semantic content attached to it. It has syntactic structure and semantic content. Maybe it has more than that as well, but it has at least that. Let's talk about where the semantic content comes from. What is our story about meaning? According to the Gricean story, semantic content for sentences in a public language traces back to intentions on the part of speakers to communicate certain ideas with the noises that they make. Notice intentions are mental entities 
right from the start. So if your story about how you distinguish linguistic behavior from mere noise bottoms out with an appeal to intentions on the part of a speaker to mean one thing by the noises that they're making, you cannot distinguish linguistic behavior from mere physical noises or marks on a paper without already having a theory of mind in place when you start. So the Jones myth can't even coherently get off the ground without a clear, clean theory observation distinction that allows a behaviorist starting point to the myth, namely one that makes linguistic behavior a completely observable phenomenon that doesn't require a theory of mind, an appeal to mentation of any sort to distinguish linguistic behavior from mere noise. It strikes me that that is not likely to be possible. Um, in fact, this is, uh, I don't even know the name of this paper, but Robert Audie, uh, when I was, I think in my first semester of grad school, came to our department and gave a talk on what he thought was wrong with behaviorism. And it was precisely this point. So um, action theory began seriously in the 1960s. Um, it began with Wittgenstein asking the question, what's the difference between my arm going up and me raising my arm? The first one, my arm going up, can be a mere event. The second one is not a mere event. My raising my arm is an action, not merely the event of my arm going up. And the standard view in action theory is that you distinguish actions from events, at least in part, by appeal to intentions. The intentionality of actions in comparison with the no need for intentionality in mere events. And it turns out if that's right, then behaviorism can't even get started because obviously if you think you're gonna get along without the mind and only do stimulus response patterns, you have to start by identifying behavior. The behavior of raising an arm versus an arm going up. That turns out, according to Audie, to be something that can't be done. So behaviorism has to be abandoned. You're gonna to have to have the story of human behavior start with something about mental entities from the start. And that plagues Jones myth just as much as it plague, plagues classical behaviorism. Okay, now the second thing that uh, the Jones myth does, he had stage one for thoughts. That's what we've been talking about. He's got a second stage for sensations. Um, and the model for the latter this fits in with the claim about the priority of is language to looks language. It begins from sensible features of ordinary objects. So the theory posits replicas of objects that are internal and not visible to account for the commonality between seeing a red object, seeing something that looks red, and it's looking as though something red is present. So on the Jones myth, <clears throat> you're going to begin with features of uh, objects in your environment, and that will come prior to, theoretically speaking, the aspects of the model that posit these internal duplicates or replicas. Um, and note here that the commonality between all of these is in the speech reports. Now, we don't need to focus a lot on this. We spent some time talking about the looks red and is red stuff. Um, the point of this is we're supposed to, in the end, endorse the myth together with sellers. This is just how we developed our theory of the mind. Mentation came in on the basis of non-mental understandings of observation reports and observational experiences. Then we model stuff on the inside on the basis of these external observable behavior features. And we end up with a theory of the mind that posits internal episodes both in the form of thoughts and in the form of sensations. Um, as I see things, this story is a lost cause. It's a lost cause for precisely the same reasons that behaviorism itself is a lost cause. It's interesting to notice that as theories of the mind developed later on after metaphysics comes back into favor in philosophy through the work of Kripke especially, Behaviorism, behaviorism gets abandoned in favor of um, more sophisticated theories of the mind that still try to link 
the mind with human behavior, but not in the simplistic way that behaviorism does and not in the simplistic ways that underlie the Jones myth. So in any case, that's the end of our discussion of sellers. Um, <clears throat> I hope that helps make some sense of this incredibly difficult paper to process. What we do next is turn to Chisholm. And as I see Chisholm, he has the most fundamental uh, criticisms to make of analytic philosophy, and especially the logical empiricism and positivism that comes out of the Vienna Circle and culminates in the work of Carnap. So we will take up Chisholm in our next lecture.